Good morning, Good morning to, to all, all of you. Of you. Uh, I, want I want to welcome, welcome you to this, to this event, event, whether you whether are you present, present here in post in, post in Stockholm, Stockholm, or you are or following, following this event online, online from, from elsewhere. elsewhere. And, I know, and I know that, that, that there, there are many, many of you of following, you following uh, uh, online, uh, uh, several, several hundred, hundred in fact. In fact. Uh, uh, my, my name is Anna Jungen-Lurgen, and I have the pleasure and honor of being the moderator of this event. Uh, uh, with, with, with the with team, the team combat, combating long-term long unemployment, unemployment among, among immigrants, immigrants beyond, beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. pandemic. This, this seminar, seminar is brought to you by the Nordic, Nordic Cooperation, Cooperation on, integration on Integration and Inclusion, and inclusion Program, program which, is which is the Nordic, Nordic countries, countries' integration, integration efforts, efforts by bolstering, by bolstering Nordic, Nordic Cooperation on the integration of refugees and immigrants. Through sharing, the, uh, through sharing of experiences uh, and development of new knowledge. The Nordic countries have a common challenge in ensuring that refugees and immigrants establish themselves in the new societies. The gap in labor market participation between the native born population and immigrants are a, is a persisting problem. <clears throat> and it's particularly large for low educated, non-EU citizens and women. The unemployment rates for foreign-born were already higher than those of their native-born peers before the pandemic, uh, but rose even further in 2020. And even in the wake uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, foreign-born labor market situation remains more precarious than for their native-born peers. Today, we will hear the results from a new report that has focused on the long-term unemployment among immigrants and how the situation is in the different Nordic countries. And I can already mention that this brand new report includes 11 concrete learnings that can, that can be used as a checklist uh, by policymakers, employers, and education providers in supporting long-term unemployed immigrants going forward. And we will, of course, also hear best practices that has been carried out successfully in order to meet the challenge, uh, meet the challenges. So we have a very interesting few hours uh, ahead of us. Uh, I hope that you will be an active audience. Uh, we will allow questions after every speaker. So just if you are here present, raise your hand. And if you're online, please write your question in the chat. Uh, and we try and we hope that we can bring many of these questions into the discussions. Uh, for access accessibility, uh, we have a speech to text service and, and you find this service in the panel below in, in the Zoom window. Uh, we have splendid speakers here today, uh, but unfortunately not a lot of time. So I think I will give the floor to our first speaker, which is uh, senior advisor Kaisa Kepsu from the Nordic Welfare Center, who will give us short welcoming words. Kaisa, go ahead. Thank you, Anna. So on behalf of the Nordic Council of Ministers, uh, I would like to wish you all a welcome to the seminar as well. Like Anna mentioned, we have a cooperation program in uh, the integration and inclusion of uh, refugees and immigrants into the Nordic countries. And it's a cooperation program between the Nordic Welfare Center that I am representing and Nordregio. And my colleague, Helena Lagerkrantz, is managing the chat right now. So please, like Anna said, be active there in the chat. So without further ado, and so that you don't have to listen to my croaky voice anymore, I will leave the floor to uh, two of uh, the two editors of the report, Osa Strom Hildestrand and Nora Sanchez Gassen from Nordregia. Please. Before you enter the stage, I would also like to introduce uh, our next two speakers. Well, go, please go ahead here. Uh, we have Nora Sanchez Gassen and, and Osa Strem Hildestrand. Would you also like to show you yourself to, to the audience? 
yes. Uh, and these are the two brilliant editors of the report that I just mentioned. Uh, Nora Sanchez Gassen is a political scientist and demographer and works as a senior research fellow at Nordregio. And Åsa Ström Hildestrand is a project manager and co-editor of the report, and she is also working at Nordregio. Uh, so happy to have you both here today, and I'm thrilled to hear about the findings uh, and how the situation is in the Nordic countries and what measures have been taken and what has actually worked as well. So uh, with no further ado, I give the floor to you, Nora. possible. Um, in the meantime, I introduce myself. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Noah sanchez Kassen, and as just said, I'm a senior research fellow working at Nordregio, and together with my colleague, Osa Ström Hildestrand, I've edited through the report um, that we will uh, present here, that we will launch here today. And you can see the title here on the slide. It's called Combating Long-Term Unemployment Among Immigrants. We look at the period during and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic, and we compare experiences in the Nordic countries. And also, and I were not the only ones at Nordregio working on this report. We had five brilliant colleagues working together with us, our country experts, and several of them are also here today, which is great. So if there are any questions later on specifically for certain countries, they can join the discussion and help us answer some of the questions. In the next 20 minutes or so, Osa and I then have the pleasure and try to summarize some of the key findings uh, from the report for you. And I can start by saying that we uh, worked with this report for a year. We started one year ago in the autumn of 2021. Uh, I can have the next slide now, uh, please. Um, we started in the autumn of 2021. And by that time, it had already become clear um, that, ah, can I do it? Ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't know I had myself. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, one year ago, it had already become quite clear uh, that immigrants had been one of the vulnerable groups uh, on the Nordic labor markets when the pandemic hit. We all know that during the first phases of the pandemic, quite a few people became unemployed. Um, many of them were immigrants, and there's different reasons for that. One of them is that many immigrants worked in sectors before the pandemic that were then strongly hit uh, during the pandemic. Um, one of the reasons why many of them lost their jobs. So this was well documented, uh, the vulnerable position of immigrants, not only in the Nordics, also in other Western countries. Uh, amongst others, we published this report that you see here on the side. What we then wondered is, does this mean that also long-term unemployment increased among immigrants because of the pandemic? In other words, we wondered what happened to the immigrants when they became unemployed. It could well be that many of the immigrants quite rapidly found a new job. In that case, the unemployment might not be so, so severe. That might not be such a big challenge. But it could also be that perhaps in this pandemic context, when many businesses uh, put hirings on hold, maybe it was more difficult to find a new job. So there we would, would see an increased risk for long-term unemployment. And with long-term unemployment, we mean periods of long-term uh, unemployment that uh, last at least for 12 months. So we were wondering, do we see an impact here as well? And if yes, that would be much more concerning because we know from research literature that the longer unemployment lasts, the harder it becomes for people to find a new job for different reasons. Uh, motivation decreases, um, mental health might even decrease, skills might become outdated, employers might become more hesitant to employ someone who has been out of the labor market for a long time. So this would be much more concerning. And here we wanted to know more because we found there's not a lot of systematic knowledge uh, available already to help us uh, with this question. So we defined three questions uh, for our project that we wanted to to answer and where we have, uh, thought we could contribute a little bit to the knowledge base. First, we wanted to simply take stock, as I said, um, of long-term unemployment trends in the Nordic countries. We wanted to understand what has happened during the pandemic. How do the Nordic countries compare to each other? And of course, we wanted to have a specific focus on the situation of immigrants and then the situation also of native-born people to see if there's any differences there. And secondly, we were also interested in finding out how Nordic governments uh, have reacted in the pandemic, if there were perhaps any specific measures, specific policies, specific initiatives to support long-term unemployed people, perhaps something specific even for immigrants. So here we also wanted to know more, how was this dealt with during the pandemic? And what can we learn also from our experiences? And then thirdly, from previous work, we know that there's quite a lot of really interesting uh, initiatives going on at local level in the Nordic countries, and many of those initiatives work with long-term unemployed immigrants 
or in general immigrant groups who struggle on the labor market. So here we thought this is a really good um, opportunity to dig a little bit deeper and look a bit more systematically. What kind of solutions do we find at local level in the Nordic countries and what can we learn from all of these experiences? And as we already just heard, we try to develop um, some lessons uh, based on all of these experiences, a sort of checklist that hopefully can be used by policymakers who work with long term unemployed people and, and some best uh, tips on, on how you can uh, help this group. We will hear about this from Osa later. So we can start to look at some of our findings and, and maybe start by looking at some of the long-term unemployment trends that we found. I can't show you the results for all the Nordic countries. We don't have time for that, but I'm going to show you for a few countries. And then if you're interested, you can look in the report and find many more details there. Well, we can start by looking at Denmark. Here we look at a timeline that starts, if you look over there, January 2019, so one year before the pandemic. And we look all the way until June 2020. So the, that was the last data we had available. So the early summer of this year. So period before the pandemic, the pandemic and the most recent months. What you see on the figure is the number of people who were registered as being long-term unemployed in Denmark throughout this period. And the blue line that you see there, that's the native born population, people born in Denmark who were registered as long-term unemployed. The pink line, that's foreign born people foreign born population immigrants were registered as being long term unemployed. Now, if you compare that, there's a few things um, that you could um, that you could see. If we start there on the left side, you can see that before the pandemic in 2019, there are a couple of bumps in the trend. But overall, the number of long term unemployed people was relatively stable among immigrants it even slightly declined. But then here you see in bold when the pandemic started, and you see how the number of long-term unemployed people actually really increased in Denmark quite visibly, both among the native born population and among immigrants. The number peaked in April, 2021, the spring of 2021. And since then we've seen this really impressive decline, very fast decline, so a very, very positive development. And if you look at the latest data here, you can see that the number of long-term unemployed people in Denmark today is actually below what we had before the pandemic in 2019. So a very positive development. And that also goes for the immigrant population. Um, you can also see that if you compare the two lines, there's, of course, many more uh, native born people who are registered as long term unemployed in Denmark, simply because the immigrant population is also much smaller. But do know that the immigrants are actually overrepresented among the long term unemployed. In Denmark, 12% of the population are foreign born, but among the long term unemployed, they make up 30% of that group. So even though the numbers are lower, they're overrepresented in this group. And the same goes for many of the other Nordic countries. I also put Iceland here as another case to look at a lot of very uh, similar trends that we can see um, in Iceland long term unemployment already started to increase uh, slightly before the pandemic, but then that, that accelerated when the pandemic started, and then especially here. Um, in, in early 2021 one year uh, after the start of the pandemic, you can really see how the number increases interestingly the number peaked also in spring 2021 pretty much at the same time as in Denmark and again we see this decline happening. But you can also notice that here, the most recent data we have show that in Iceland, at least to the re most recent data, long term unemployment is still higher uh, than before the pandemic. So there is still a way to go. And the last example that I put here for you is Sweden, the case of Sweden. I think, yeah, um, we have a bit shorter timeline here, but you overall you see similar trends. Uh, the number of long-term unemployed people increases over the pandemic, again, peaks in the spring of 2021. And the last one and a half years, there has been a slow decline. Uh, two things are important to note in Sweden. One thing that sticks out is that in Sweden, actually, the majority of long-term unemployed people is an immig are immigrants. So not there, they're overrepresented, of course, in terms of their population size. But even in absolute numbers, we have more long-term unemployed immigrants in, in, in Sweden than uh, native born Swedes. And that's a bit specific to the Swedish context. So here, this really sticks out. A another thing you could note is that the numbers in Sweden are still quite high. If you look carefully, we have around 100,000 long term unemployed immigrants uh, in Sweden, according to the most recent data, and 60,000 native born speakers who are long term unemployed, 160,000 people in total. That more or less equals the population of Örebro, as if the entire population of Örebro was long term unemployed. So this is really still a, a big challenge and uh, really still something that we need to address, even though, as we can see, the trend is also going down here. So this is positive. So what can we take away from this? Some key messages. As I try to show you, the most uh, recent one and a half years have been very positive 
a long term unemployment is going down everywhere. So really nice. And, and the immigrants also are, are profiting from this trend. Um, but here come four buts. As I try to show in Sweden, the number of long term unemployed people is still quite high. Also in Finland, for example, and in Iceland, numbers of long term unemployed people are still higher than before the pandemic. So still some work to be done. Um, we also know that the figures that I just showed to you may not show the whole picture. It is quite likely that during the pandemic, as people became unemployed and didn't find a new job, it's quite likely that some of them simply left the labor force, left the labor market for health reasons, perhaps to take care of children, to take care of older parents. And those people you wouldn't even see in the statistics. So there might be more, um, and not only what I just showed you here. We also see that the trend for the last one and a half years has been very positive, but I think we cannot completely trust that that will continue in the future. We know that currently the situation is very uncertain. War in Ukraine is still going on. Inflation is rising. We have high energy prices. We don't know how that will affect businesses, our labor markets, jobs in the winter, for example. So even though the trend is very positive, I think it's important to stay proactive and not just rely on that that trend will, will continue. And then as a final point, even though the trends have been very positive, we also do know that some groups of immigrants still struggle on the Nordic labor markets. And that's especially immigrants with low levels of education, among them many women, among them many refugees. Why is it that immigrants with low levels of education still struggle? Well, one of the main reasons is that on the Nordic labor markets and in Sweden and Norway in particular, there's quite simply not very many jobs available for those who don't have specialized trainings, um, specialized skills, university education. Uh, there's not that many jobs available uh, where you can simply come and, and learn things on the job or do routine tasks. And there's a lot of competition for those jobs that exist. Uh, and especially Sweden and, and Norway stand out here in a European comparison of, as having particularly few jobs. So this sort of increases the challenge here. What can we take away from this then? So I think we know jobs are available in the Nordic countries. We even know that in, in certain sectors, uh, we now have shortages of labor. We have a mismatch problem here. So this is one of the big tasks for us to go ahead. We need to make sure that the immigrants that are still struggling on the labor markets get the competence and skills, especially in the sectors where currently workforce is missing and, and, and try to get a chance to get in those jobs here. Upskilling, that's, that's a big task for the future. And here we have heard um, interesting stories from different cases, um, interesting stories that we can learn from. And, and also is gonna tell you more about those now. Um, it's really, really good to be here. Uh, I don't know if you use this water glass, but I, no, I, <laughs> I think it would be nice to have one. Thank you, dear. Um, so this uh, report project has been making strange noises. I don't know. Is it better now? I don't know. Let's see. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, this uh, report has been a team effort, as we said, and uh, the beautiful thing when we look at all the Nordic countries is that we see that there are many similarities, but also some different approaches and, and uh, good opportunities to learn and, and see uh, the same sort of problem or challenge from slightly different angles. And also depending on political situation, choices, et cetera, we do see different solutions develop. And of course, also because of different geographies and different, different uh, other pre preconditions. Um, okay. Um, I really don't know what's happening with, is this my mic that is weird? No? All right, I think I'm getting a new mic. I'm sorry about this interruption. So let's see if this works better. All right, great. Um, all right, so how did the Nordic countries address long-term unemployment during the pandemic? Um, and again, here, what we have seen is that in most cases, there were no really new approaches. Must be my hair then, or what is it? <laughs> what? It's from the house. Interesting. Okay. All right. Let's see if it works. Um, 
Right. So in most cases, there were no new strategies or approaches tested during the pandemic, but in some cases, some extra funding. We know that Norway has invested heavily more than the other countries in different things. Uh, and also Denmark pushed out extra funding to the municipalities during the pandemic, but not specifically as a result of the pandemic always. The, the other big exception here when we talk about new, uh, new ideas, new approaches was Iceland. And that was primarily because there was no unemployment among immigrants in Iceland before the pandemic, because immigrants in Iceland mainly come to work. So it's been a very labor migrant heavy situation in Iceland. And we'll hear more about Iceland soon because we have another Icelandic speaker here today, which is great. Um, anyway, measures uh, coordinated at the national level often didn't target immigrants specifically, but uh, at the local level, uh, many programs did. And that's also where municipalities could see that with the increasing long-term long unemployment, they really also had to do something um, and uh, try to reduce labor market exclusion. Um, local projects focus also increasingly on matching with existing jobs and also upskilling, as we put in here. Um, so more and more uh, people realize that, okay, there are jobs here still. We have to just upskill people so they can take these jobs. Um, the target group was very often women, as we already talked about, and or immigrants with lower levels of education. Because again, this group came out as the most vulnerable also during this crisis and for, for different reasons that, that uh, Nora already touched upon. Um, it's also... Um, many common traits between these initiatives. And that is what has led us to summarize these learnings into a checklist that I will present very soon. Um, it was also quite interesting to see that uh, quite recently, last week in Dagen Samhälle, which is a very uh, um, important daily for us who work with regional and local development in Sweden. Uh, there was a new study cited that actually by Tapio Salonen and other researchers who have looked into municipal programs uh, around Sweden and, and international research also on what actually works. And I was really curious when I read it to see if it sort of aligns with the findings that we had from all these Nordic examples. And luckily, uh, they do align quite well. So I do feel that, that with this, uh, uh, our checklist is kind of even more valid. Although, of course, we should see this as this is a, a you know, limited in time kind of project. So we see these as learnings, reflections from looking at many different, uh, different initiatives and projects that have been ongoing in at the local level in the Nordic countries. And they do give us some hints on what works. So let's see what's in the checklist. We also actually printed a few uh, if you want to want to bring them home right now. We, we'll make a better uh, version of this uh, later on and post online as well. And of course, this is also available in the report. All right, checklist, combat long-term unemployment, three fundamental principles that are probably not new to you, but we thought that we have to put them in here because they're very fundamental. And for anyone who wants to start or plan or improve a program targeting this uh, target audience of long-term unemployed people, these are very, very important to consider. And the most successful cases that we looked at all considered these things very carefully. Number one, consider gender aspects, leave no housewives behind. And we know that there are many housewives, family reasons, different, different context. Uh, maybe they didn't work before they came to the Nordic countries. Uh, they might end up in, in exclusion in a way that is it's just not, uh, not helpful for them. And it doesn't help us with the integration process. Um, and of course, it's, it's, it's a way of us not using their talents and, and, uh, and uh, resources. So we have to work with schedules and also challenge stereotypes when we do these programs. Um, we have to consider and use a holistic and individual approach. There is definitely not one size fits all with this target group. And uh, this should just be underlined. One-on-one -on -one support is needed. Yes, it's expensive, but it does pay off. And we have a great example from Denmark here today. We'll hear much more about how you do this in practice. 
um, with mentorship, peer-to-peer -peer support, maybe even in your native language. So that's a lot of things that you can do in this way. And of course, last but not least, fight prejudice and discrimination. We do see in recent reports, if you have a Muslim name, if you wear the hijab, you are just less likely to get a job uh, on the Nordic labor market. And we have to work on this. And we all have prejudice. We just have to you know, acknowledge it and, and challenge ourselves. All right, so, and this is a picture we would like to see more of, more men in healthcare and care, preferably even taking care of babies. We know that that's one of the biggest challenges when it comes to gender in the Nordics, the gender segregated labor market. Checklist number two, we talk about better program organization. And here, um, the, the number one thing is to have a solid national local level collaboration. So in the countries, when there is solid long-term national funding for projects, initiatives, work happening at the local level, it pays off. And here there are challenges specifically in Sweden, and we're super happy that Arbets Million is with us today to comment a little bit, because it's been a lot of reforms, it's been a lot of new ideas, a lot about uh, using market-based solutions instead of, of collaborating directly with municipalities, you have to hire um, pro um, private sector service providers. And that is not always helpful for the municipalities when they try to work in dialogue with Arbetsförmedlingen. So that's one example. But anyways, it's, it's great when this works. And we do see that it works in most of the Nordic countries. Um, strive for a long-term systematic approach. This is, of course, a no-brainer. In the best of worlds, <laughs> there is a lot of funding out there and we can all work long-term because short projects, they tend to, you know, if, if there is not a sustainable model for your project, it might not render the results in the long-term that you actually were hoping for. And we do know that pilot projects are useful to develop new methods, to be innovative. But, but how can we work more carefully to strive for sustainability? And here we see that it's very important to learn from others and also collaborate with your neighboring municipalities, with the regional actors, and also with companies in public-private partnerships, right? That's also a way to accumulate more funding and to set up better effective programs that work for, for both public and private sector. And using wage subsidies, um, as we put here, has also really been highlighted in all the country studies. That's the most effective thing to, to raise the competitiveness of long-term unemployed on the labor market. So we should always use all financial means that are out there in a smart way. And we'll again also hear more from Iceland how they used uh, wage subsidies or grants to create many, many new jobs during the pandemic. Um, and again, social enterprises also play a role. And we have our Danish case here with us today to tell us more. Um, a guy in construction or industry is also a common picture. That's been a lot, a lot of, of uh, um, demand for labor in, in the construction sector. And that's one of the sectors where we really don't know. It's going to be very affected or it is very affected. Uh, by the rising prices, etc. cetera. Um, anyways, last part of the checklist, lessons for better uh, program content. So these are a few principles that we also see are very prevalent in the successful programs and initiatives. So always focus on matching. As Inora's quote earlier, this is increasingly the challenge on the Nordic labor market. Um, employers need to define training content. They need to be part of that discussion of modules. What are they going to learn? And again, KHRS are here from Denmark, and they work exactly this way uh, with the training program that, is, uh, that makes the employers feel that they know what they get when they hire people who took your program. And that's super effective. Um, and then more students get employed with the right skills. It's as easy as that. And another key thing that, we, uh, that comes up is how do we motivate students? How do we get more people to actually join the programs? And that is about setting clear targets and goals for the training and preferably 
employment, employment guarantee uh, once you're done with the training, right? And provide student loans or other financial means so, so people can actually afford to take the training. Um, of course, we also need to map and build on when we do the matching, when we recruit people, clients to do students to the programs, we have to build on their existing competencies, experiences and commitment. So we really know that they're interested. So we see the programs that work hard on very careful matching and, uh, and where people know what to expect from the training and have an idea of what kind of job they will be doing after. That's a success factor. And last but not least, focus on the combination of language training and vocational training. And here we've seen in Karlstad, Sweden, for example, we have Yrkes SFI. We have that in many municipalities, but, but they've taken it to the next level of really combining language teachers, sit with the skills teachers, and they develop the program together. What language do we need to know to do these skills? And then on the job training, etc. So when that works in a strategic way, that creates a better program. And last but not least, go digital. Use apps, robots, virtual realities to improve language practice and the gaming logic. I don't know how many of you use language apps. How many of you do Duolingo? At least one, you, that's very unusual. Well, my family does it all the time. I'm the only one who don't. But anyway, the, the gaming logic is cool, right? It just creates uh, that feeling that you have to continue. You have to learn more, you have to practice more. And this is also something we'll hear from, from Denmark, how you used your app, the Easy Learn. And in Finland, you can look and see more in the Finnish case in a uh, Finland chapter in the report, uh, how they work with, with VR, which is also a very strong tool to put students in a lifelike situation, in a store, in, in a factory or whatever. And you just start training the language as if you were there. So very, very cool. And another final thing to just uh, not forget uh, to also start with the women, have this specific focus on women who are might not even be in the statistics of long term unemployed. So this is again just a call to leave no one behind, right? And here we also have lots of interesting practices across the Nordics. We want to highlight Bydelsmödrarna from Denmark, actually a German model to begin with, I think, that's now spreading to Norway, Sweden, etc. Community-based, um, peer-to-peer mentoring, other migrant women who uh, reach out, create safe spaces, create activities where women feel safe to go. And that's a way to, to just start by meeting, by coming out from your home and, and get engaged in, in the community. So we hope you get inspired by these Nordic cases, um, find more examples in the report and of course on Integration Norden website as well uh, for our Nordic integration collaboration. Um, yes, thank you for listening. Um, download the report, questions or thoughts, you can always email us if you read something strange in there. And also, of course, uh, everything we have about the Nordic collaboration is at integrationnorden.org. Yes. Thank you. A big applaud for Nora and Åsa. Can I just move here? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. You okay, I move there. here. Yes, and, and congratulations on a very interesting and important report. Uh, there are many, many topics that, that I would like to follow up on. Uh, but let me just start with, with the question. Um, what was the most striking findings when, when editing this report? Was it the, the high numbers in Sweden or was it the, the good examples on the local level initiatives that has been done? What, what was the most striking thing? I'm happy that we have a representative here um, because they had so many good ideas. Uh, they had to start from scratch because as Osa said, there were not a lot of uh, unemployed immigrants in Iceland before. So they had to start from scratch and develop something new. And I think they did really inspiring work. I, don't, I won't say too much because we will hear about it later, but that, that was surprising to me. I didn't know about that before, but I thought that was uh, really nice to read about. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, th the striking thing is the similarities mm -hmm. between these things that work, which means that there is knowledge, right? We know what to do, we know what works, and I'm sure that 
most of the points in the checklist weren't new to you, but we just thought when we accum accumulate them, when we put them together, it creates a full picture of something that we can actually learn from. And I think the main thing is to learn from each other and really don't start from scratch. Just, just learn from the best and see what they've done. Because many of these cases have also developed over time. And then you see that, all right, they've learned along the way and they have really developed something that works. And that we can really utilize the resources of these people. And it's such a win-win thing when, when you get to activate people and you see how they flourish. And again, that's also what we'll hear from, from Denmark soon. You already touched upon this, but uh, in the public discussion, uh, on labor market integration of immigrants, one all, often gets the, the sense that this is merely considered as a, as a challenge. Uh, should we move the discussion to see, see uh, immigration uh, and, and uh, the labor market as a, as a resource? And how can we do this? You, you mentioned uh, labor shortage. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, quite often we look at this as a, as a big challenge, but we also have to see what value this brings to our societies. If these, I said, for example, in Sweden, 160,000 people, if we could bring those into the labor force, that would be fantastic. We have sectors where, where labor force is really needed, where we need helping hands. Um, so we, we also have to consider that is a, a huge opportunity mm -hmm. for our Nordic countries. And a lot of these people bring skills uh, and motivations that, like I said, are perhaps not always a perfect match uh, to the Nordic labor markets. But if we manage to bring them there, that's mm. really something that helps us. We have aging populations as well. Um, we we need uh, we need those people, uh, so we should really consider them as a, as a good resource for our countries. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think that's from Norwegia perspective also when we look at the demography of mm. the Nordic countries, the main thing is really the aging population mm. and, and the, the depopulation or uneven population structure across the Nordic regions. So, so yes, we need labor and we need to really, mm. uh, yeah, make good use of, of, of all these resources. Do agree. Is there a question here? Uh, no? If not, I will say thank you, Osa and, and Nora. And you as, so as mentioned, you find the, the report to be downloaded and, and questions can always be addressed to you. Absolutely. And, okay. and don't, uh, yeah, don't be shy. Please reach out. And we also like to hear from you and out there. If you out there, now I look into the camera, uh, who follow us online, if you have, uh, have new uh, perspectives and things and new uh, projects that we're not aware of, just let us know. That's also good to know. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> uh, we need to move on and give the floor to our next speaker. And that is Arild Vågen. Uh, Arild is an analyst at the Swedish Public Employment uh, Service and is specialized in the establishing of newly arrived immigrants and on long-term um, uh, unemployment. And he's also uh, a member of the Nordic Experts Committee on Integration. I'm so happy to have you here uh, and I look forward uh, to hear your comments on the subject and maybe you will also hear your thoughts on, on why long-term unemployment is so high in Sweden. So, Aril, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning and thank you. I'm very happy to be here today and I'm very happy to read uh, the report. It was very interesting. It's very helpful for us with working with a long time unemployment and immigration. Um, I will say a few words about the situation in Sweden today. Um, here you can see the, the unemployment in Sweden uh, for people who have been unemployed to 12 months or less. And the second group was 12 months or more. And you can see a very high percent of the group is have less than 12 years education. They have they're born outside Europe and have reduced working capacity due to disability. But at the same time, we also know that many foreign born people have disabilities who we didn't know about arbitrary has not been very successful in discover disabilities for foreign born job seekers. Uh, and at the same time as Nora and also pointed out, it's very few jobs in Sweden 
and we don't require uh, um, education. So it, we have a big, um, a big job here to find jobs. Uh, here we have registered job seekers for 12, 24 and 36 months. Uh, the blue one is people who have been uh, without job in one year. The second one is people who have been without job in two years. And the third one is more than three years. And you see here what the, it, it's, it's um, this, despite the good uh, opportunity to find your business freedom, Today, we see new <coughs> the people we see new <coughs> we see at, at the steam rising, the group will have been web job for three years. Um, and Arabs Union have got two new assignments from the government uh, in 2022. Uh, the first one is to analyze a report on the needs of the long-term unemployed. And the second one is reduce long-term unemployment. The second one has a uh, focus on uh, socioeconomic poor areas uh, to work harder there. Um, when we're working with an assignment, we added this who are long term unemployed, which efforts did to progression for the group. And we looked both at the research, but also the experience from various projects. For example, the two projects mentioned in the report, uh, Mamma Crafton and Etterbering Slifted. Um, but the assignment focuses not only on was born abroad, but also on other groups of long term and employed. Um, uh, <coughs> it also um, empowered an assignment to reduce unemployment with work it at the same time. Uh, and we have some focus area in our work. Um, we need to be better to identify, identify support needs earlier. We have, we need to do a better mapping, or we need better mapping tools to assess job seekers' pre-existing skills and competences. We think we have a lot to learn there. We was kind of successful in some project like the Jämstad etablering or early entry, uh, equal entry project. Uh, we are working with the National Local Level co Collaboration. Uh, we are making a new guideline together with the Pins in Sweden uh, to form new agreement on collaboration. We need to get more people into regular education. We need to better cooperation with uh, schools and local government to find better and more easy way to start education. We need a more focus on employers. Uh, we also need uh, more gender mainstreaming in our own work where we look at our statistic, 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 we can see what fewer wom women, for example, take part in on-job training. And we can see what more immigrants will come to average meeting, uh, more male leaving for work. So we really need to work more with gender mainstreaming. And we also have um, government assignment about gender mainstreaming in the entire Arbetsförmedling. Uh, also, many of our focus area is worked out to the um, uh, 
checklist in the reports. We need to ensure an effective national local level co co collaboration. We need to map and build on job seekers' comp competences and commitment. And we no need to focus on matching. Employer need, needs should define training contents in higher degree than today. Uh, also, since we are responding and is in a reformation at the moment, we have to use a more private service provider. It's not a choice, it, it, it's an assignment to do so. So we need to work with better form to share information with private service provider, with local medicine bills, with schools and our own work. Um, I think that was the end of my presentation. I'm ready to question. Yes, perfect. And a big applaud also to Ariel. Thank you so much. Uh, you mentioned uh, in, in your presentation uh, uh, the need for an effective uh, national local level collaboration. Yes. But, but what needs to be in place? What has to be done in order to, to get this uh, good collaboration? Uh, for the last uh, year, we have an assignment to uh, make a better one. So we have talked to the Esquire, it's the organization for the municipalities and regions in Sweden. Uh, to form new agreements. And uh, so I think that, that's the key, but we also need uh, to be better to sharing information so we can work together uh, around a uh, person. Because many uh, long-term unemployed people need maybe different helps, they need some training, some uh, maybe some Swedish course, as maybe uh, other support. So we need to work better together to support every single. And also see the, the persons as individuals. Yes. Perfect. Uh, are there any questions here in the audience? Yes, we have one there. Just hang on, you'll get the microphone. Hello, I'm Linda Björkman. I'm from Stockholm Stad. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Arbus Spelling is, is doing this journey with digitalization. Uh, and as we heard before, the best way to get a person into a job is by face-to-face -face contact. <clears throat> what is Arbus Spelling thinking about uh, this journey? Because the last years you... Uh, 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 we have we have certain limitation due to, due to budget uh, due to uh, assignment about using a private provider, for example. But I think what we need to do is to understand that some of the digital solution we have uh, created the last year is very good, but maybe not very good for people who is very far away from from Arbetsmarknaden. Uh, uh, so we need to find a way to, to work better with people who have been unemployed for a longer, t longer t period of time. Good. Uh, finally, Ariel, uh, what, what is the biggest takeaway you take from, from the report? Uh, what is most striking from the report, from your perspective? Um, I have, uh, I think it's a very interesting report um, just to find different approaches to learn more about Denmark, for example, we work in different ways in Denmark and Sweden and sometimes maybe we are more focusing just on the job, we, you, how in Denmark sometimes an approach to do more for the, for the person, looking more about the situation around the, the, the person. More holistic. Yes. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to, to see. And Thank you so much, Ariel. Thank you.
Now we are moving on and uh, we are about to hear about a best practice from Iceland. Uh, and our next speaker is Björk Håkansson, who is the head of uh, international department at the Directorate of Labour in Iceland. And I know that Björk is Icelandic, but of Swedish origin since her grandfather immigrated uh, from uh, Sweden to Reykjavik. Uh, roughly 100 years ago for work. Uh, and Jörg will tell us about the measure Let's Go Get to Work Iceland, an initiative uh, that engaged employers in creating thousands of jobs. Uh, and this truly sounds like a rosy fairy tale uh, and a true success story. So Björk, the stage is yours uh, to tell us more about this initiative. Please go ahead. Hi, the pressure. <laughs> mm. All right. Um, so I've been introduced, so there's no need to. Um, I'm here to talk about um, the initiative Havim Storf, um, and um, which is mentioned in the report. And it was a large scale uh, labor market initiative. Uh, with the aim of engaging companies and creating thousands of new jobs with substantial support from the government in the aftermath of COVID. Um, wide range of stakeholders were brought to the table from governments, municipalities, private businesses, uh, business and workers association, along with the Execute Partner Directorate of Labour. Uh, the initiative launch, uh, was launched while we were still in the eye of the COVID storm, basically, in March 21. And it would last until end of December the same year. The focus was to improve outreach and create new jobs, like 7,000 of them. Um, the idea and the, um, the idea and the activities to be carried out we had to change the course with unemployment sky high and hundreds of companies facing closure, action plan was needed. Uh, the initiative was both uh, aimed at immigrants and native workers alike, uh, but only partly focused on long-term unemployed persons. But companies would get more support when hiring those who had been 12 months or more unemployed. Uh, to put it simply, Ministry of Social Affairs and uh, a steering committee from the Directorate of Labour would design an action plan to support companies to create new jobs or regaining lost ones. At the same time, job seekers would be able to get back on track with a job offer, offer up front it's not simple, it wasn't really, but it was doable. Companies of all sizes could apply uh, for recruitment grants uh, if they were willing to hire uh, unemployed job seekers, irrespective of the length of their unemployment, meaning hiring a long-term unemployed person would mean more support. Small businesses with fewer than 70 employees uh, who would hire long-term unemployed persons would even get more substantial support if the recruitment would increase the total number of staff in their company. Um, another idea was the NGOs, the nonprofit organization. They were allowed to set up uh, temporary projects and hire staff who would be paid through this national funding facilities. If government or municipality wanted to use the recruitment scheme, they would have to hire people that had already been 24 months or more unemployed. So the restrictions were in place. Um, we had to move mountains basically in two weeks. And so we did. First, it had to be added some special provisions to the existing regulations and law, and then uh, for all those good ideas to become a reality, uh, more was needed. 
many, many, many extra hours later behind the scene, we would have to adjust the IT system, create new online application platform, uh, facilita facilitate that all jobs coming in would be uh, advertised within our relatively senior IT system at the directorate. And all this uh, to create faster and easier hiring process. Quicker, clearer, simpler. And so we did launch the Hevium Storf on the 22nd of March, 1922. Uh, the international angle of Hevium Storf. Uh, having start started with a blow and within the first two weeks we had already over 3,000 jobs registered. The international team decided to act quickly uh, by starting with translating the idea of the initiative to its multinational client base. Uh, we needed to direct them towards this specific measure or more clearly to make sure they would equally benefit from the initiative. In March 2021, we were still facing on and off lockdowns due to COVID, and there were restrictions in place at our premises forbidding us to invite job seekers in large group for interviews or information meetings. The relatively newly established international team of less than 10 members of staff sat down and came up with an outreach plan we were left with no other option but to call them, hoping it would increase the likelihood they would benefit. Uh, at this time, in the beginning of 21, unemployment rate among immigrants was up to around 27%. The preparation phone call was executed. Staff language skills and phone translating systems were used. Questionnaires were formulated for getting more explicit info and profile updates. We would go over how to act and how to apply. Additionally, we would screen for employability. Uh, emphasis was set on, uh, on importance of clear CV and we set the tone with a positive attitude uh, and excitement, which we were, uh, for having them with us to change the course of the situation in the countries. More like, we can do this together. There was one fundamental rule. You have to answer the phone when they call. We were going to make sure immigrants would get their fair share of the 7,000 new jobs. Um, COVID struck Iceland especially hard because tourism had become such a big part of the economy meaning that when COVID hit, the tourism industry, the immigrant working force, were those who first lost their jobs. Before COVID, long-term unemployment among immigrants was higher than Icelandic job seekers. What we were interested in trying to do and use the opportunity was to decrease the cap and have him starve, by having him starve, uh, by starting bringing long-term unemployment among immigrants down. And the settlement of Havium Sturf, um, by the end of uh, December 2021, we had already registered 16,000 jobs in total. We aimed for 7,000. Um, in total, uh, job contracts with recruitment grants that were created were little over 8,000. What was pleasant and surprised during having Sturf was that all recruitment in the country increased with or without grant, indicating an impact force that is still ongoing today. In short, having Sturf was a success for all job seekers, regardless of gender or origin. And what was pleasing is the percentage of recruitment grants during heavy surf of immigrants were 45% of all grants. Uh, unemployment has generally been considerably higher among foreign nationals than individual with Icelandic citizenship. So this was good news and brought down some earlier hindrances. On this slide, 
we can see the classification of grants during heavy surf by the by industry and the orange columns show the tourism industry which was about half of all the jobs created during that time in in the end uh, the green bars represent immigrant workers uh, that were hired during the heavy surf and the initiative reached its peak during the summer months may june and july uh, and again, jobs in tourism. And for the lifetime of having Sturf, which was nine months, 77% on average did not return on benefits three months after their contract would come to an end. That is six months contract. In the case of having Sturf, we expected or, or more like feared that uh, the ratio of comebacks would be much, much higher but it didn't happen. And now, around four months uh, after the last contract within Heavy Stir finalized, we are still seeing uh, the success of the initiative with unemployment rate of less than 3% in Iceland. So... <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Björk. You, uh, and I, you, you said that no pressure when, when we started, but, but it is truly a success story uh, and, and impressive. And I hope that, that uh, we can all be inspired by, by this initiative. Uh, you mentioned uh, that, that it was mostly uh, companies uh, in, in the tourism sector that applied mm. for grants, but what other uh, sectors uh, uh, were involved in this initiative. I mean, the rest, the rest, fifty percent was was uh, many, many different sectors. Um, builders, for example, the construction industry, and uh, all kind of service uh, industries as well. We even had um, problems with the uh, uh, medical industry, where uh, hospitals needed more manpower after COVID. So that was also part of it, and uh, yeah. So all kinds of, of all kinds, yeah. Uh, but what 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 happens now? Do you have uh, when, mm. when the support from the government ends? Uh, do you have new plans and new measures? Uh, yeah, uh, designed already. Well, what we did already last summer, um, when when some of the grants were still uh, ongoing, uh, we started to think about the approach, and it's been said here before that um, even though it was a phone call away, um, we decided um, since that went so well, let's meet the people. So we started systematically inviting people for information meetings uh, when they had registered on unemployment benefits. So now we are systematically meeting up with people in their third, sixth, ninth, twelfth, twentieth and twenty-fourth month of unemployment with a specific aim each time, meaning that we're trying to see in uh, hopefully in the next uh, half a year or so to see the decrease of 12 months plus on our unemployment rate. So, yeah, so Impressive. we're going to try that. Impressive. Yeah. Great. Are there any questions to, to Björk? Yes. Yeah, um, Osa here um, from, from the team, the project team. I was just so curious, how could they start employing in the tourism industry when the tourists were gone? Or was it a big push for, for domestic tourism? Oh, they came back. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. that's what happened. So okay. that's what happened because we had those gaps in the, the closure of the countries. And every time we kind of open up, it just floated in again. So, and, and, uh, and also... We were also making sure that those companies would be there for a few months with less to do, uh, equipped with manpower, so they would be ready when COVID would relieve. So that was also the idea behind the whole thing. Yeah, instead of closing the companies, they would be able to stand, you know, during the storm. So, yeah. You, you mentioned that you, you were moving mountains in two weeks yeah. and, and you really were. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, with, mm. a, with a very tight timetable. Yeah. Uh, 
how did you do that? I mean, is it because of the sm quite small population in Iceland? Absolutely. Was... Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, the, the hindrances of, of, of distance is not really in place. So people could uh, really, I mean, uh, information flow was, was clear and the, the campaign uh, and the action plan was clear. So, uh, so and, and it's a little bit in our genes up there. So, you know. Okay, yeah. I hopefully it's in our genes. As well. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Thank you again, you Björk, welcome. for this. And a big applaud again to Björk. Sorry. And uh, last but not least, we will have. Sorry. Don't didn't get a question. Nope. You have sent it to the wrong person, I suppose. But we we if you can read it from from your WhatsApp. No. Hey, that's no it's all of it then no i, I just I'm checked to, <laughs> yes see welcome see. i'll see you from this side this is helena laga trans yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, we have a question from uh, from emily and it's about the icelandic uh, case it was still it's wonderful initiative in iceland but how i iceland will manage with um underemployment immigrants okay many high skilled specialists work jobs under the educational level so C can you please repeat yeah. the question there i i think the question is this example is about uh, persons with a low educated level but there are a lot of immigrants that are working on the beneath their education level yes uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Is that a how to, that how, to, how to measure their um, education? The how, the, how to work with the high skilled specialists that actually are working mm -hmm. um, beneath their right. education yeah. level. Yeah, it's a it's a constant uh, battle. And um, what we are trying to do, we are trying to be more transparent in translating uh, education between countries. And uh, it is improving, and it has been improving, uh, but we're not there yet, yeah. unfortunately. And I guess that is a, a Nordic problem. Yeah. I guess so. It's a Nordic problem, and it's a problem with, with, with the matching to, mm. to find uh, the right person for, for the right job. Thank you, Helena. Was that all? Yeah, for now. Okay. Uh, I'll try to get yeah. this to yes, perfect. Uh, thank you, Helena, and thank you, Björk. Uh, last but not least, uh, we will hear about the success story in Denmark, the KHRS Academy in Copenhagen, uh, which is a cleaning company that trains and employs uh, immigrants with limited language and work experience. And for this part, we have three speakers in total. Camilla Spehi, who is the project lead of the KHRS Academy, and E. Assel Learn, you will hear what that is uh, later on. Uh, and then we have Lukas Rosenquist, who is the project co-lead. Uh, and finally, we are given the chance to listen to Samira Safai Edine, uh, who is here to, to share her experiences and perspectives of being an, an immigrant woman and finding her way in Denmark uh, in the Danish labor market and how the, the KHRS has helped her. So we are very Pleased to have you all here, uh, and I give the floor to you. Like this? Hi, good. Hello. Um, we're very thrilled to be here and to be part of the uh, great report. And we hope to, um, to, that you find our approaches to be inspiring. Uh, Samir will be speaking later on and you will be able to ask her some questions. First of all, um, we'll just yeah, try to, to keep it short. Uh, we're a service company um, who've existed for 
like that? Okay. Uh, we've, we've existed in more than 41 years. Um, we have around 300 employees and um, 76 nationalities. Um, we, um, we have great experience in training and employing people with less fortunate uh, circumstances and to have them maintain job functions within the service industry, uh, mainly uh, long and un unemployed people, um, especially women, uh, which will be uh, approaching later on. In uh, 2006, in 2006, actually, uh, we had the first project called um, Gripsko uh, Project Project Fiafa in Sweden, known as Sammenbygd. I don't know if any of you recognize it. No? Mm -hmm. uh, you can just scan the QR code, the one at the right, and you'll be able to read more about it. Um, yeah, due to the uh, achievement and uh, great acknowledgement of the projects in uh, 2016, we won the, um, we were the winner of the first Oaken uh, House of Elspreets. Copenhagen Industry Prize, basically. Exactly. Yeah. So as mentioned earlier, uh, holistic thinking is what we uh, actually practice a lot in KJRS. Um, this is like a mapping tool, you could say a screening um, tool as well. So when we uh, have a citizen or an employee, we look at the, um, you know, the whole human, uh, which is really important if we uh, intend to think about, um, yeah, long-term um, approach. So we look at the financial situation, um, social, uh, are there any issues um, mentally, physically, could be um, the, new, the, the, you know, the lack of language uh, upskilling needs. Um, and for that, we have uh, great tools for upskilling. Um, yeah, and also, uh, <laughs> As mentioned earlier as well, we, um, we have these special checklists, which we use um, effectively actually, um, especially for, yeah, job functions. Yeah. Um, what is really important to mention regarding this, these approaches is that they're, um, they're very expensive. Um, and resourceful, but they're very effective, uh, especially thinking long-term. So we've actually managed to practice these uh, during the years and they, um, yeah, they're effective. So it works for us. Thank you. Um, and thank you also for all the kind words. It's um, very flattering. Um, so um, yeah, this is also a, a tool just to have a sp uh, small overview of um, our approaches at the, um, at the company, uh, upskilling industry-oriented courses. Um, basically, we try to, um, try to match our employees with a job function that we think works for them. And if we realize that something doesn't work or they are in one way or another unsuited for um, the job function we're trying to give them. We would rather try to put them into a new function or help them integrate into the company uh, in a different way. We, we don't want to lose people. Um, we want to help as much as we can, um, which is also part of the holistic approach that we, uh, that we do. Um, and as mentioned, we, um, we do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer training and we have a lot of peer-to-peer -peer approaches with uh, mentorships. So if we have a new employee um, who perhaps doesn't speak, uh, speak uh, Danish, we try to match them with a mentor that has been in the company for a while uh, that maintains the same job function as them, that speaks their language. So they have somebody that can support them while they're, while they're in training until they can maintain their job function alone. Um, and to achieve this, um, we do our screening interviews, we do our uh, tailored courses, so basically also part of the holistic approach, try to make a course that matches the employee, uh, which practical upskilling, which is um, also part of easy learn, which we'll um, hear about a little bit later. Um, and then 
for our outcome, we hope that our employees um, achieve some professional and personal development. Um, and it also helps us achieve a sustainable company culture through our CSR policies. Um, and it also helps with the ret retention of the employees. Um, as I said, we don't want to lose employees and we don't want people to fall back into being on benefits. So it is, even as Camilla said, even as, if it's very resourceful um, and high maintenance in some way to keep working with your employees to help them, we also feel that we not only as a company benefit, but it's also benefit, uh, beneficial to the society that we do our best attempts to keep our employees in a job function. Um, so yeah, in, in effect, it's, uh, it's an attempt to keep the uh, target group supported and employed. Um, and as I said, match an industry that is in need for recruitment. Um, we are a uh, cleaning company, basically. So um, we work with a lot of hotels, um, have different job functions in that uh, service, both the hotel and restaurant business, which there's always need of people there. So it's not necessarily hard for us to find work for employees there. Um, so in overall, we also achieve better growth and improved integration, not only for our company, but also for the society. Um, so yeah, I have a uh, graph here of the, the employment of non-Western immigrant women. Um, it's, it's in Danish, but the green, um, the green part is um, people that have started in the, or women that have started the courses in, in total. The light blue is those that have dropped out and the dark blue are those that have achieved ordinary employment um, at our company. So as you can see on the left, uh, no, sorry, on the right, uh, we have, um, it, that does not include um, immigrants from the Philippines, China, Thailand, and Vietnam. And on the right, that is solely non-Western immigrant women from the Philippines, China, Thailand, and Vietnam. Um, well, I'm gonna move to the next slide. And we also try to work with our Nordic um, neighboring countries. So this is um, candidates from Sweden that have um, achieved employment at KHRS um, last year you know, from June to October. Um, so yes, yeah, so as you can see on the right side, we have um, the women, um, nine from Somalia, three from Lebanon, three from Syria, one from Bosnia, one from Iraq and Kurdistan. And then the men on the left side, we have six from Syria, one from Palestine, one from Jordan, and another man from Iraq and Kurdistan. So, Easy Learn, uh, which is our upskilling app that uh, we have worked on. Uh, it currently supports um, 11 different languages. Um, helps the um, helps the course participant to um, improve at a certain job function. We have uh, 24 courses targeted at the um, the service industry. So they they um, are taught things like ergonomics, uh, housekeeping principles, hygiene, how to handle food, um, so on and so forth. So this is also where we use our gamification. Um, so all, every, every single time the course participant will be uh, received by an instructional video of what the course entails and how to use the app. Then there will be a, um, a list of material that is needed to complete the course. And then this is where the gamification comes in. There's a single choice game, a multiple choice game, then puzzle words and puzzle cards where the course participant has to match different specific uh, words that are used in a specific industry or in the specific course with pictures um, uh, until they can do a final test that basically basically grants them a certificate um, for having completed the course. Uh, can I go on to the next slide, Camilla? Not yet, okay. Um, so yeah, now we want to very briefly show you uh, some parts of uh, Easy Learn. Um, sorry for the uh, intermission. I think we are. Yeah, there was some. Um, there was a QR code where you could um, download the app and try it as well. But you can also get it on our website. Uh, 
Uh, uh, I will I'll, I'll give her the microphone. <laughs> Uh, sorry, the question again. We did um, from Erhvervshus Copenhagen. Um, it was part of, uh, it's called Omstillingspolien. It was part of a public support to companies struggling during uh, the pandemic. And instead of, you know, just doing all the same over and over, we, you know, we thought about why not um, rethink our approaches and maybe even try to, you know, um, reach further demographically. So that was actually the, the uh, yeah, the vision behind EasyLearn. But yeah, we did. Great. <laughs> okay, so I think, uh, I think we're getting through to, what, to the website now. <laughs> language. Um, so as... Arabic. So um, when Camilla is finished logging in, uh, <laughs> uh, we will just very briefly show you some of the material and some of the uh, the gamification. And then I believe we have uh, a very short review from uh, one of one or two of our employees of uh, of the app that have um, who have been testing it recently. So yeah, as you see here, uh, we have. Um, this is the overview of the, the different courses. Um, you can see we have um, it's protective equipment, work environment and safety, food hygiene, ergonomics. I think we are doing ergonomics. Sorry, because uh, is it free for me to use anywhere? Um, it is. Uh, it is currently not free. It is a. Um, it has until recently been a pilot project that we have been uh, doing in doing with some municipalities in uh, in Denmark. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can find it on our uh, website, khrsacademy.dk, uh, um, and on the e learndk website. Uh, it is also available to download there. And you can find it on the App Store and um, on Google Play Market, I believe it's called. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, Camilla, if I can invite you here also, uh, and, and thank you both for sharing your experience and knowledge. And I was, say, I was very impressed about the holistic thinking that you have. Uh, and uh, I hopefully, uh, or I hope that, that you have been able to inspire also other companies in Copenhagen. Is that so? Um, sorry, you need to have. Yeah, sorry. We surely have. Um, we work with uh, different um, companies and geos and so on in Denmark, but also uh, Swedish uh, companies as well. Um, and also, just before I forget, um, the platform is learned. You know, it's our own platform and also our own app. So it's actually open for further development and it's available in Swedish, Norway. Um, so yeah, we, we, you know, we always, um, we always try to keep involved in different things. Um, Cause yeah, it's important that we learn from each other. And I m must mention also that I, I loved when you talked about the growth, both for the company, but also for the society, society. as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that, uh, it's very valuable and, and, and nice to hear. Uh, now we need to move on because time is running out. And, and Camilla, you need to stay here. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, and I would like I would like to invite uh, Samira Safai Edina here on stage. Welcome, Samira. Uh, and, and Samira is originally from Morocco. Uh, and I know that you prefer to speak Arabic, so that's why we have uh, interpretation here. So, uh, Samira, tell me a little bit about yourself. When did you arrive to Denmark and what's your history? 
نفسك هيك وقولي انت اجيت على الديناريك وشو شو قصتك يعني انا سميره صفاء الدين انا جيت للدنمارك 2017 My name is Samira uh, Safaeddin and uh, I came to Denmark in 2017. Yeah. Yes. 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 I هذه المدرسة رسلوني على البراكتيك شركة ديال أوكيز. I'm start working with KHRS since 2019 and the job center they sent Samira to us and she she start in training in the beginning and after she got a contract in 2019. ولقيت ما واحدة مغربية هي اللي علمتني الشغل علمتني كيف سوي كده 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 وأنا تعلمت من عند she's an alphabet so Yeah, she's unable to write and uh, read. So yeah. that's why she helped her. Uh, we have a special tools. So she helped her in that way. Yeah. 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 She explained that it was the mentorship and she showed her everything the way and the rules in Denmark and uh, uh, in the workplace, uh, she she learned her uh, she learned her on the special way, yeah. Alhamdulillah, مع الشركة كوز هما كيعونوني هما كل شيء أي شيء بيسوولي هما يسوولي. زي إيش؟ رسائل جيني رسائل جيوني بحال دبا هادي دي حق الإقامة هما سوولي كله. And thanks God, I'm working with KHRS uh, because they help me um, not only in the workplace and they give me a contract. Um, they help me also with the papers uh, from immigration to translate. Uh, when she received the digital uh, email post, also the, uh, she came to the office and we help her. We uh, we manage everything for her. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, God, again. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Uh, so, so as I understand it, it it's the, the personal approach and, and the individual support and the mentorship that has been the most successful thing about the project. Yeah. And all, yeah, but all like, yeah, he shall little no, no, can make you okay for the show or the real Anna bin Sadik via Hail Lisadatic for show. A war okay, he decided if so, he let me keep a sayup, keep her, keep her. Yeah, yeah, it was the mentorship and also the trust she has. She feels safety with the company, she's not feeling that she's an employee and this a company. She she has another connection a good relationship and it's very important also that is yeah. lovely to hear yes uh i want to ask you finally samira what are your plans what are your dreams what do you want to do with your life شو بتقولك شو يعني التخطيطات تاعتك في المستقبل شو احلامك بالمستقبل ان شاء الله نتعلم نقرا وان شاء الله المستقبل الحمد لله نتعلم نقرا her dreams is uh, that uh, she wants to learn Danish and uh, she also wants to learn uh, write and read uh, uh, Danish and uh, Arabic, man. Yeah. yeah, and Arabic also. Yeah. Yes. Actually, I think it's very important to know just also that uh, when we uh, first had uh, Samira employed at KJRS, uh, she was very um, insecure about herself.
And that's why I think it's a great achievement to see you here today in Stockholm, um, living alone. Yeah, so big applause. <laughs> واحدة ما ما نعرف إلا شيء ولكن دبل الحمد لله تعلمت كل شيء وليت نعرف كل شيء الحمد لله. Yeah, yeah. She knows everything now. In the beginning, she uh, <laughs> she, uh, she 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 didn't have any experience, and uh, now she feel more stronger and uh, confident. Confident, yeah. Yes, so empowered uh, by yeah. by the initiative. That's that's wonderful. <laughs> Uh, I received one question here, and, and I don't know who wants to, to, any of the speakers can actually answer this. Uh, it's from, from a person who is following us online, Katinka Kauhke. Uh, than, than a question and I to be here today uh, thank you so much and thank you to all the speakers thank you uh, unfortunately we are a bit over time already uh, so I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, all of the speakers here today. You have all been wonderful and inspiring uh, for, for your ex uh, excellent presentations and, and speeches. Uh, and of course, also thank you in the audience here, but also you online. Uh, please note that uh, on the website integrationnorden.org, you'll find more info on uh, on the subject integration in the Nordics and the site is actually really packed with with info and facts and and different links and of course you can also uh, contact Helena Lagerkantz who you saw her, her here earlier and also Kaisa Kepsu if you have further questions so thank you so much and let's continue uh, this very important work thank you <laughs>